Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another episode of our knowledge series. In this session, we are going to talk about money laundering, which is an important topic under internal security. Under the knowledge series initiative, we have been covering many important static topics that will help you prepare for both prelims and mains, especially for the 2023 attempt. So if you have been benefiting from the knowledge series initiative, do let us know by pressing the like button. Share these videos with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's start with the discussion for today's session, which is money laundering. As I mentioned, money laundering is an important topic under internal security. It's very important for your mains and there could also be a potential question in your prelims as well. So in this session, we're going to understand what is money laundering? What is the process involved in money laundering? What is the security threat that emanates from money laundering? And in what ways money laundering can be tackled? If you guys remember, we had had a related discussion a few weeks back when we took up a discussion on FATF or the Financial Action Task Force. So under FATF, we had covered a, a few basics related to money laundering. The, the video for the same for FATF is also provided in the description box below if you want to better understand what does FATF has to do with money laundering. But in today's session, we are going to focus on the process of money laundering. We'll understand how money laundering is an economic threat and a security threat. In recent times, especially in the last few years, many of you would have come across this term known as money laundering in newspapers. Either because of its connections with terror financing. You might have read in newspapers that Pakistan has been placed on the grey list of FATF because it has not been able to tackle money laundering. Because of these related issues, you would have come across this term known as money laundering. Also in India, in the last few years, there have been many high-profile economic offences. Many high-profile individuals like involving the likes of Vijay Malya, Lalit Modi, Neera Modi and the others. They have absconded from our country. They have become economic fugitives. They have fled abroad because of their involvement in economic offences, which included money laundering. So in this context as well, money laundering is frequently in news. There are several ongoing cases being handled by the Enforcement Directorate, which is looking to tackle the, the threat posed by money laundering. So with regard to these recent developments, the term money laundering is frequently in news. It's an important topic under internal security as well, under GS Paper 3. Because money laundering is not just a threat to our economic security and economic stability, but it also poses a threat to our national security. So that is why it's important to understand this topic in complete detail. So let's begin by understanding the definition of money laundering. What do you mean by money laundering? See, in simple terms, laundering refers to cleaning something or washing something. For example, we say that we got our clothes laundered meaning dirty clothes were washed or cleaned. Something similar happens with money as well. Of course, not in a literal sense, but money which is dirty, that is, that is sourced from illegal methods, that has dirt on it. This money is cleaned or laundered through a process known as money laundering. Now, if this seems a little confusing to you, let's go in detail, break down this topic, simplify it and understand what is money laundering with examples? See, money laundering is essentially a process. It's an illegal process through which black money is converted into white money or into legal wealth. This would be the simplest definition of money laundering. It's a process, an illegal process through which black money or illegally generated wealth through illegal activities this is laundered or cleaned of its dirt, of its origin, and it is turned into legal wealth. This whole process is referred to as money laundering. In fact, there is a UN convention as well called the Vienna Convention of 1988 that provides the definition of money laundering as well. I have included that definition over here for the sake of your better understanding. Even the UN Vienna Convention says that any conversion or transfer of property or wealth despite knowing that this wealth is derived from illegal activities, right? And if it is disguised and converted into legal wealth, 
in order to evade the legal consequences, then this whole process of transforming black money into white money is known as money laundering. See, money laundering today has become a very, very serious economic threat. This is a challenge that affects not just one country or few country, countries. It's a challenge that's affecting the global economy itself. Because money laundering happens on a global scale. This process of converting illegal wealth into legal wealth, it can't be pulled off by few individuals. It can't be carried out by just a few organizations. There is a global network involved, a global mafia of sorts involved in enabling money laundering. There are many corrupt officials, ministers who, who might be a part of this network. There would be organized criminals, terror outfits, and even banking and financial institutions, which might be taking part in the channels of money laundering. It's essentially a global level scandal that takes place and it threatens the global financial stability and also enables organized crime and terror financing. That is why money laundering is such a serious offense. In fact, according to data that was brought out by the UN Office on Drugs and Crime back in 2009, around 3.6% of cr criminal proceeds, the total criminal proceeds that are generated through criminal activities like drug trafficking, arms smuggling, etc., that alone accounts for 3.6% of the global GDP. Through various illegal criminal activities, that is through organized criminal activities, there's a lot of illegal wealth that is being generated around the world. These illegal activities involves prostitution, corruption within the government, drug trafficking, arms smuggling. So all these illegal activities, they generate a lot of illegal wealth. According to the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, this illegal wealth generated mainly from organized crime stands at around 3.6% of global GDP. This was back in 2009. Out of this, 2.7% of it, that was around $1.6 trillion, was being laundered. Meaning, this illegal wealth was being converted into white money, into legal wealth. It was being channeled back into the financial system. If you go back, the IMF or the International Monetary Fund had also brought out a report back in 1998. And according to this report, Around 2 to 5 percent of the global GDP involves money that is laundered. This was back in 1998. Now imagine with advances in technology, with advances in cyber crimes, with rapid proliferation of electronic transfer of money, the problem of money laundering has amplified, aggravated over the last two to three decades. According to few recent estimates, Anywhere between 1.5 to 2 trillion dollars worth of money is being laundered every year. This is nearly 4 to 5 percent of the global GDP. This is just the official estimates. Of course, you'll never get a complete picture here because the illegal wealth which is being converted into legal wealth, it is largely unaccounted for. It's very difficult to get reliable data on all the illegal activities taking place around the world. So a conservative estimate shows that around 1.5 to 2 trillion dollars is being laundered every year. That, that stands at close to 4 to 5 percent of the global GDP. It's much bigger than the GDP of many big countries. So the pro scale of the problem could be even more magnified if you take the real picture into account. If you take into account the scale of illegal activities taking place and the way in which global finances have evolved, Definitely the, the amount of money that is being laundered could be many times higher than this figure. So this puts things in perspective and helps you understand why money laundering is such a big challenge. Because it has the potential to disrupt the global financial system itself. It has the potential to impact our society as well because it has direct links with various organized criminal activities. It has links with terror financing. It has links with government corruption. It has links with drug trafficking and arms smuggling. So as a result, if money laundering is not tackled, if it is not, it, if it is not kept under check by the authorities, it could destabilize the economy, not just of our country, but the global economy as well, and could also lead to devastating consequences in the 
society and as well as with regard to our national security. So in this process of money laundering, there are few essential steps that are involved. In fact, money laundering functions like a cycle. There are few basic steps that are involved and this includes placement, which is the first step in money laundering. The second step is layering and the third step in money laundering is integration. Please make a note of these three steps that are involved in money laundering. We are going to discuss and explain this as well so that you develop a better understanding and especially for prelims, you need to be familiar with these three steps of money laundering. The three steps are placement, layering and integration. But before we look at the process, let's understand the sources of illegal wealth. How can illegal wealth be generated? Basically, what are the sources through which black money is generated? Like I said earlier, there are many sources for generating illegal wealth. One is definitely through organized crime. Organized crime, which is carried out by organized criminal groups. For example, the Dawood Ibrahim gang based out of Pakistan, Afghanistan region. The various drug cartels based out of South America. The various drug and trafficking cartels based out of Southeast Asia, especially around Myanmar, Thailand, etc. All these organized criminal groups, which function on a, on a global scale, they smuggle and traffic contraband or, or illicit items, including drugs, arms and weapons. They even enable human trafficking as well. They even push abducted women and girls into prostitution. So all these activities, illicit activities, which are organized, they fall under the definition of organized crime. This also includes cyber crime as well. All the new age crimes that have come up. They all fall under the definition of organized crime. Even trafficking of wildlife products, smuggling and trafficking of antique items, they all fall under organized crime. So all such illicit activities, illegal activities, they generate a lot of illegal wealth. Then apart from this, Corruption within the government. If government ministers, politicians are taking bribes, if bureaucrats and officials are taking bribes, all that wealth is black money. It is illegally generated wealth. Then finally, black money is also generated through tax evasion. When a high net worth individual, let's say a celebrity, maybe a sports star or a movie star, who are worth hundreds of crores, or thousands of crore rupees, if they try to evade taxes, the profit or the income that they are hiding from the government, that they are not reporting to the authorities, essentially becomes black money. Even big corporations, big companies. So basically high net worth individuals and even large private corporations, multinational corporations. If they conceal their profits, if they conceal their wealth to evade taxes, to evade paying taxes to the government, even that wealth becomes black money. Now, the illegal wealth that is generated through all these sources, it is not very useful to the actual owner of the black money. For example, an organized criminal cartel might be generating hundreds of crores or maybe millions of dollars in profit every year. But still, they may not be able to enjoy the benefits because they can't transact that money easily in the financial system. Because the source of that money itself is illegal. The same happens with politicians and bureaucrats and officials as well. Let's say there is a corrupt IAS officer taking bribe worth crores of rupees. He or she, they won't be able to spend that money freely as they want. Why? Because there are checks and balances in the system. Red flags will get triggered in the banking and financial system if such large scale suspicious transactions are taking place. The same happens with those who are evading taxes, high net worth individuals, then large companies, private corporations. They can't freely spend the money that, that they are hiding from the government and they can't introduce it back into the financial system directly. Because if they try to do that, chances are very high that they'll be caught. There will be red flags that will go up in the banking financial system. The suspicious transactions will be flagged and back end investigations will happen, which will lead the authorities towards the source of the illegal funds. It will lead towards the corruption in the government or towards the criminal activities or towards tax evasion. 
So essentially, the owners of illegal wealth, the owners of the black money, they can't freely spend it the way they want. That is why they have to create a distance between them and the money. They have to create a distance between the sources through which the illegal wealth was generated and the actual money itself. This is where the process, the process of money laundering comes in. This is where money laundering helps them. Money laundering helps them to create a distance between the actual owner of the black wealth and the actual money that has been generated. It helps in removing this dirt. The dirt is nothing but the illegal source. The illegal nature of that money itself is the dirt. The identity of the actual owner is the dirt that is sitting on the money. Of course, in a virtual sense. So that is why those who own black money in large quantities, in crores of rupees, millions of dollars, they employ money laundering agents. They take the services of money laundering agents to clean their wealth, to launder their wealth, so that the black wealth becomes clean wealth. So in this, the first step is placement. The owners of black money, they themselves can't do it. They need to take the help of money laundering agents. This could be corrupt officials in the banking and financial system. It could be criminal groups themselves who might be offering these services. It could be government officials, officials of the central bank as well. There could even be global financial consulting agencies which might be offering money laundering services for a commission. Since the money involved is very, very huge, all the middlemen who enable money laundering, they get a cut, they get a, a commission out of it, which drives this, this illegal business. So the owners of black money, when they want to launder the money, when they want to create a distance between the illegal wealth and the illegal sources, they employ the money laundering agents who will place the money into the financial system through various routes. There are many methods available to do that. We're going to discuss those methods as well in the next slide. Through various routes and methods, the illegal wealth is placed back into the financial system and we call this step as placement. The money is introduced back into the financial system, but of course, under different names and different identities. Several fake accounts are opened, several fake transactions are carried out or the large sum of money is split into smaller sums and the money is moved around different banks and different locations around the world so that the money gets placed back into the financial system. But this alone will not launder the money, it will not clean the money, it will not remove the dirt. To do that, they have to carry out the second step which is layering. In layering, a series of complex transactions are carried out around the world. For example, the money might be taken to an offshore location. There are countries where they offer high secrecy in their banking system. So the money can be deposited in such locations, in such jurisdictions, where they offer a lot of secrecy regarding the wealth that is being deposited and also regarding the identity of the owner. Or it could be placed in low tax havens or zero tax jurisdictions or very complex transactions can be carried out by using various financial instruments. Through various financial instruments, the money can be moved around. Essentially, a series of complex financial transactions are carried out and these are actually professionals who specialize in doing it. These are the middlemen who offer these services. And like I said, sometimes corrupt bank officials and uh, officials in the financial system might be a part of this nexus. There could be central bank officials involved in it. There could be government officials involved in it. There could be very prominent private banks and con finance consulting firms who might be offering these services for a commission. They specialize in carrying out such complex financial transactions and their job is to layer the money. They carry out series of complicated transactions around the world through various accounts to various banks. And eventually, if you try to trace the origin of the money, the authorities will get lost. They will not be able to trace back the, the actual source. They will not be able to link this money, which is being layered, back with the actual owner and the actual source. So that is the motive of the second step. The motive is to layer the money under, under steps and steps of complex transactions so that 
a complete distance is created between the, the money and the actual owner and the source. So once the layering step is completed, the money is laundered. The money is clean right now. The illegal source has been removed from it. The owner's identity has been separated from it. So this is laundered wealth. It is as good as clean white wealth or legal wealth. And now this is brought back through last step, through the last step that is integration. It is brought back into the hands of the owners through various routes. And they can start using this money to invest. Maybe they can invest this as FDI, foreign direct investment in other countries. They could invest this as foreign institutional investment in the capital markets, in the stock markets. They could use this to buy luxury assets. They could purchase real estate, gold, jewelry, expensive items. So this completes the cycle, the process of money laundering. First, the money is placed into the financial system. Then series of complex transactions are carried out under the layering step. Once the money is laundered and clean, it is integrated back into the owner's hand. Now they can spend this money freely through various routes, use it for making investments and purchases. And hence, the illegal wealth now became clean wealth for them. So this is the process of money laundering in short. Now, obviously, many of you would have a doubt. What are the methods? What are the steps that are actually involved over here? How can money be moved around so easily? So let's take a look at some of these steps. We'll have a brief discussion on some of the different routes and methods involved in moving money around the world through these complex transactions. One method is smurfing. There could be a prelims question. UPSC could ask what is smurfing related to, right? So you should just have a basic idea what is smurfing and how it enables money laundering. In smurfing, what the money laundering agents, what they do is that they take the large sum of money. Let's say 100 crore rupees. Let's say a few million dollars, just for example. Now, if they try to move this large sum of money in one shot, in one transaction, chances are high that will trigger an alert in the system. Red flags will go up and there could be an investigation. It might be flagged as a suspicious transaction. So instead, what they do is they break up this large sum into many, many small transactions. They will carry out transactions of 1 lakh rupees, not more than that, maybe 50,000 rupees. So the process of breaking down the large sum of money into small sums and then transacting that to place it back into the financial system. This is known as smurfing. Is that clear? The large sum of money is broken down into smaller sums. Then it is moved around through many fraudulent accounts, through various banks. The placement step is done. Then the money is again moved around the world to carry out layering where many more complex financial transactions are carried out. Eventually, the dirt of the money is removed. Another method or popular route is through electronic money transfers or wire transfers. With evolution in e-commerce, with evolution in electronic banking and digital banking, it's become much more easier today to move money around. Right? So it's very easy for the money launderers to commit fraudulent transactions. This would require the help of the banking officials. This might require the, the help of government authorities or authorities in central banks, right? So this is a very high level scandal that might happen where fraudulent accounts are op opened in different names. Benami accounts basically are opened. Fraudulent transactions are carried out and money is freely moved around from one jurisdiction to another. Usually they prefer countries. They prefer countries where the anti money laundering steps measures are weak. They prefer those jurisdictions where there is a high level of secrecy guaranteed by the banking system. They prefer those countries and jurisdictions where the anti money laundering steps and measures implemented are very weak so that they can avoid any scrutiny, any suspicion and wire transfers can enable money laundering as well. This is basically fraudulent banking transactions. Then you also have informal routes like Hawala networks or Hawala transactions. Many of you might have heard about Hawala networks. Hawala transactions is part of Islamic banking. It's a traditional banking system. And per se, Hawala transactions by themselves are not entirely illegal. But Hawala networks have been misused for money laundering and terror financing. 
Havala transactions are entirely informal. They work entirely on the basis of trust. It basically works on the basis of mouth to mouth transaction. In case of Havala transactions, no records are kept. There, are, there is no account of any transaction, no documentation. There is no evidence that is left behind. It happens purely through word of mouth, purely on the basis of trust. Now, let's say I want to transfer 10 crore rupees to my relative in the US. Let's say I'm person A, I want to transfer around 10 crore rupees to a relative of mine who is in the United States and let's call him person B. If I want to make use of Havala networks, I'll approach a Havala agent in India and I will give him the details. I will give him that this is the amount to be transferred to the recipient, give him the identity of the recipient. The Havala agent in India will contact his counterpart in the US. He will guide him to the actual destination, to the recipient. He will ask him to transfer the equivalent amount of it. The money actually never leaves India. The actual transaction never takes place. But the Havala agents who have this network around the world, they make the transaction happen. Right? So it's a very informal network. It's an informal way of transferring money. And this has been misused by money launderers and, and even terror groups and criminal groups. So Havala routes are preferred by money laundering agents. Then like I said, offshore accounts. There are many countries which offer very high level secrecy in their banking system. You might have heard about Swiss banks, for example. You might have heard about Panama, Liechtenstein. These are certain countries where the banking system guarantees a lot of secrecy to those who open accounts with these banks and deposit large sums of money. They will not reveal the identity, the information with any authorities. So the money is often moved to these offshore accounts and parked in those offshore accounts. From there, layering is done, series of complex transactions are carried out and they are brought into tax havens. There are some small countries, small island nations in the world, which have declared themselves as tax havens. For example, Mauritius. You might have heard about Cook Islands, or even the Cayman Islands, Panama. All these are low tax or zero tax jurisdictions. Since these are very small island countries, they attract some investments, they promise zero tax or low tax, and this helps drive some revenue to their governments. So these low tax jurisdictions or tax havens are also misused by money launderers. They move the money here, avoid paying taxes, carry out all the transactions they need to launder the money. Once the money is clean, they place the money in fake companies called shell corporations or shell companies. These are basically front organizations. They are fake entities. It's not a real company. The company will have no genuine business of its own. But the money is placed into the accounts of this money through fake billing. It is shown that as if the company has some genuine business going on, as if it is selling some goods, providing certain services. Fake bills and fake invoices are generated and the money is moved into these shell companies. These are just front entities, front organizations covering the money laundering that is happening, happening behind the scenes. Through these shell companies, which are located usually in tax havens, the money is integrated back. It is brought back to the source, let's say India in this case. That is why Mauritius happens to be the top source of FDI investments into India. One reason why Mauritius is the biggest source of FDI investments into India is because one, it is a low tax jurisdiction, right? Investors like to take the benefit out of that. There's nothing wrong with that. Second, money launderers are using Mauritius to push laundered money as FDI back into India so that the owners who own the black wealth in India get the money back as FDI or through investments in the capital market and then they can use the money as they want. Now, since the money has completed one entire circuit or one entire circle, this whole process is also referred to as round tripping because the black wealth, let's say which was generated in India by criminals or politicians or government officials or by tax evaders. This black money was moved out of India first for placement. It was layered around the world through complex transactions, finally brought back to India as genuine investments. So the money has taken one entire round. So the process is also known as round tripping. 
So through these complex routes, through, through these complex transactions, the process of money laundering is enabled. Today it has become much more easier with the proliferation of cryptocurrencies, which provide a great deal of anonymity. Bitcoins, Ethereum and the others, they offer a great deal of anonymity to their owners and it has become a preferred route for money laundering. Organized criminal groups, terrorists are using cryptocurrencies to move money around. That is why governments and central banks, they are against cryptocurrencies. Even casinos, casinos are a, a preferred destination for money launderers. They exchange the illegal wealth for uh, chips in the casinos, later exchange it again for money and show as if it, they earned this through gambling and move the money around through complex transactions. So these are just some examples I'm trying to give here so that you have awareness regarding the different methods through which money can be laundered. Generally in the real world, just one method is not used. Maybe a combination of different methods are used to launder the money and to integrate it back into the hands of the actual owners. So this, this global level scam that takes place, it is a big threat, not just to the economic security of our nation, of the world as well, but it is also a very big national security threat. See, without a doubt, it, de it destabilizes our banking and financial system. It affects government revenue as well. It could compromise our economic sovereignty because it is, it is leading to disruption in the macroeconomic fundamentals. It could disrupt the foreign exchange reserves of the country. It could lead to volatility in the capital inflows, right? So it could affect macroeconomic factors as well. It could compromise the government's revenue and the economic sovereignty of the nation. It could also affect our currency, the valuation of a currency. It could lead to a large scale destabilization of the banking and financial system itself. So this naturally affects growth and development. And since it is connected with government corruption, it can breed corruption. Many government officials, many bureaucrats, ministers, politicians would, would be involved in the nexus. It further breeds corruption. So this hampers governance as well, affects growth and development. And more importantly, it has social and geopolitical consequences as well. Because it is very closely linked with organized crime. Now imagine what will happen if drugs, drug trafficking is enabled through money laundering, right? It will lead to drug addiction, especially amongst the youth. It could proliferate arms and weapons because arms and weapons trafficking is linked with money laundering. This could also enable terror financing because terror groups have close links with organized criminal cartels. For example, look at how Pakistan based terror outfits have close links with the D gang or the Daud Ibrahim gang. This could also enable hostile countries, their hostile intelligence agencies to use money laundering as a route to carry out terror financing. For example, how Pakistan through its intelligence agency, the ISI uses money laundering routes to fund various anti India terror outfits, right? So this is a grave threat to the country's national security as well, because it is directly enabling organized crime and terror financing. That is why money laundering is a very, very important issue. That is why the topic has been included under internal security in our UPSC syllabus as well. So it's very essential to tackle and prevent money laundering. And that is why we have a global framework because it's a global level scandal. At the global level, we have an intergovernmental body, the FATF or Financial Action Task Force. Like I mentioned at the start of the session, we have had a separate discussion on FATF a few weeks back and the same video has been provided in the description box below. So please go and watch that as well. So you understand what does the FATF do to counter money laundering. FATF was set up by the G7 countries back in 1989. Its mandate is to act as a policy making body, basically to set global regulatory standards so that countries can follow these standards and implement anti money laundering measures and counter terrorist financing measures. So all countries around the world, they're obligated to follow the FATF standards. FATF has come out with around 40 measures, 40 specific actions to increase vigilance in the banking system and financial system. For example, following better diligence 
better verification measures thorough kyc verification know your customer norms maintaining right banking financial records checking any suspicious transaction all these specific policy measures are recommended by fatf to counter money laundering and to counter terrorist financing so that is how we are tackling money laundering at the global level and india is in line with these standards india is part of the fatf we are a member of fatf we strictly follow the standards and we have implemented the standards through a dedicated national law india has enacted a national legislation which is the pmla or the prevention of money laundering act that was enacted by the parliament in the year 2002 this act has been amended repeatedly by india to improve our standards against money laundering and also to inculcate the fatf standards which are constantly evolving through this act we have declared money laundering as a criminal offense it's been made a criminal offense in our country recently in 2019 the act was amended and money laundering has been made a stand alone crime it's been made a, a scheduled offense with strict penalties the act also has provisions to confiscate the proceeds of the crime whatever proceeds are generated through money laundering whatever money is generated the illegal wealth this could be confiscated by the authorities they can attach this to the ongoing case and they can even recover the losses that might have happened to the country the proceeds of crime can be confiscated and attached to the ongoing case the confiscated properties can be seized and the government can even auction them to monetize those illegal assets in order to compensate the losses that might have happened in the banking and financial system india has even set up dedicated institutions for this we have set up a dedicated intelligence agency called financial intelligence unit india it's a dedicated intelligence agency to track suspicious transactions in the banking and financial system a dedicated law enforcement agency also has been set up called enforcement directorate or the ed or the directorate of enforcement the ed is the designated law enforcement agency to enforce the pmla to enforce the prevention of money laundering act right it registers cases related to money laundering investigates them and prosecutes the criminals who are involved in money laundering so this is how india is fighting money laundering and it's a global collaborative effort it requires the help of other countries as well authorities from other nations as well and it requires a strict compliance with fatf standards so on this note i would like to bring my discussion to an end the idea was to help you understand what is money laundering what's the process how does it threaten our economic and national security and what are the preventive steps at the global level and at the national level so i hope it it was a productive session now let's take a look at some questions can we see the questions please can i see the question sheet on the screen yeah first question sir if money laundering is happening at a global scale why is it so difficult to tackle when a crime happens on a global scale it is all the more difficult to tackle because you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions you'll need cooperation help from other authorities from other countries you'll need information from them you'll need complete assistance from other countries as well so when you have a transnational crime of a global scale it is even more difficult to deal with next will political instability in countries like afghanistan aggravate money laundering definitely yes political instability breeds all sorts of criminal and illicit activities afghanistan in particular it is the hub of drug production it's part of the golden crescent region right it's a hub of opium production narcotics are produced in large quantities in afghanistan many organized criminal cartels they smuggle and traffic drugs from afghanistan lot of these funds the the illegal wealth reaches the hands of terrorists as well there's a direct link in afghanistan between organized crime drug trafficking and terror financing so political instability definitely aggravates money laundering komal is asking how does ed get to know about money laundering by keeping a watch on the financial system or when any scams or frauds erupt right or when any, any suspicious transactions are taking place so there are checks and balances in the system there is a dedicated intelligence agency for that the fiu which watches out for any suspicious transactions even the rbi the sebi then your banks financial institutions even they have they have to follow certain standards and protocols 
as per PMLA, as per FATF standards. Even they watch out for any suspicious transactions. Next, has demonetization effectively addressed the problem of money laundering? Not really. Data and experience shows that demonetization had very little impact on money laundering. Because money laundering as a scam, as an offense, it transcends national boundaries. Action by one country and the two actions like demonetization has very little impact. Ashutosh Kumar is asking, sir, can money laundering be enabled through cryptos and NFTs? That's exactly what I mentioned. Cryptocurrencies, NFTs, all your digital currencies, they actually enable money laundering. It's easier to carry out money laundering because cryptocurrencies give you complete anonymity, right? So money launderers, they make use of it. Okay, so guys, these were the questions. I've tried answering as many as possible. I hope it was a productive, fruitful session. Do let me know how it went. Do press the like button. Share these videos with other aspirants as well. And please share your comments. The comments are very important. We'll take a look at it as well. The feedback will help us. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.